Hi, John Danton here. This is a conversation with uh, Professor Mark Blog. It took place on March 30th in 2007 when Mark was visiting here at the University of Canterbury as a Gunnarskin Fellow. This is really quite a remarkable little one hour interview into the rich life of a very, very interesting man and a very interesting economist. So uh, enjoy. Cheers, John. So when did you get interested in the history of economic thought? Like what, how did that happen, you know? Did, cause you said, because you said you, you... I was a graduate student at Columbia University. Um, what year is this? This is a 1953. 1953, okay. A few years ago. Yeah. And um, uh, my supervisor was George Stigler. George Stigler. And I was already uh, interested in the history of economic thought because um, a few years earlier, uh, I was a Marxist, Ooh. a young 18, 19, 20-year-old passionate Marxist. So where did this come from? Uh, well, I've always been left-wing. And uh, somewhere around 17 or 18, I met people who, you know, gave me Lenin. I think, yeah. Was this the foundation? Like the, the first thing I ever read was ridiculous. When I think of it now, Stalin's The Foundation of Leninism. And I read, and then I started to read some pamphlets by Lenin. I got pretty interested in Lenin. That led me, of course, back to Marx. And immediately, uh, I took to it like a duck takes to water because Marxism has a real scholastic tradition. Uh, there's a whole vocabulary. What the hell is a 17 or 18 year old are you doing interested in a scholastic tradition? <laughs> like what the, we're talking about, I, 1949 here? Th this is... Uh, 48? This is uh, 1946, 47. So just after the war? Yeah, just after the and war. And you become a passionate... And I was... I mean, what really got me about Marxism, I later realized in, at the time, was this scholastic tradition, this, this, that, this feeling that, hey, I was, I was getting into stuff that I, could, uh, that I very quickly started to explain to other people. Jeez, at 16 or 17, though, Mark. What? At 16 or 17. I mean, most teenagers are out, you know, what, I mean, what are we doing here? I was already very intellectual. Uh, I... I read a lot, but it was mostly uh, novels. Yeah, and we're talking Amsterdam here or England? This and this, no, this is, uh, this is America. I, was, I arrived in America in 1942. I was 15 years old. Uh, I always remember, very easy to remember it, because uh, a few days after I arrived, uh, the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor. So I always remember December 1942. Uh, I was 15. Wow, and, uh, and this is the, this is your story that you're telling me before about your dad having to leave uh, Holland. Yes. Uh, what year did they? Did okay, you leave? The, the, when? The year okay, oh, sorry, <laughs> I interrupt all the time. Okay, okay 1940. Ahead. Yeah. February 1940. Uh, on uh, February 1940, I was born in 1927. I'm 13. I'm 13. Uh, my father. Uh, my father, uh, who was a pessimist, decided Hitler was going to invade the lowlands. And, and he said to my brother and I, boys, we're leaving. Uh, he, my mother was English. He was Austrian. Okay. So uh, he couldn't go to England, but my mother could. So she took uh, my brother and I, uh, and we were shipped off to England. And it it's incredible to think that in uh, uh, February 1940, there was already <laughs> World War II had already been declared. Wow. Uh, the the Dutch were fl flying KLM planes from Amsterdam to London because it was the phony war period, as it's called, the phony war. The phony war. What do you mean by the that? The phony war was that there was uh, uh, Britain had declared war yeah. on, on Germany, but uh, there was no engagement. There was no engagement. Uh, so it was still actually possible to fly across the channel from Amsterdam to London. 
very difficult now to you didn't even comprehend, yeah, okay. Yeah. And so I uh, okay, so I arrived so wait, in my wait. brother and I arrived in England in nineteen forty. Yeah. Uh, we didn't see my parents for another five years uh, because they they then uh, went south to Belgium and France, uh, knowing that of course once Hitler had invaded the lowlands, that was the end of it. But they were com they were like so many other people completely surprised by the speed at which uh, Hitler took Holland, Belgium, Paris. My parents sent their passports. To Paris to leave France, and uh, Hitler took Paris. Because no passports there. They were in the middle of France uh, in 1940. Their, their two sons were in England, uh, and they uh, they couldn't get back. And you're 13. Yeah. And you're on your own in England. Uh, with my brother. And how old is your brother? He's 15. So uh, had 15 year old and 15 year old. The middle. Yeah, but we old. had relatives who yeah. uh, sort of kept an eye on us and so on. So for five years. Yeah. Uh, we, we, it, my parents had their own story. The, they they smuggled themselves uh, out of France into Spain. Because was in in turning all refugees from France, and it just into a concentration camp. My parents found themselves in uh, uh, 1940 in a <laughs> in a Franco concentration camp in Spain, and my mother, being a the, Good Jewish woman had a diamond sewn into her underwear, and out came the diamonds. And she bribed; they bribed guards to let them out of the camp. And oh and 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 they took a unofficial taxi to Lisbon. And they were in Lisbon in 1940. And then the problem was, okay, since they were in Lisbon, they wanted to get to America. So who's Portugal allied with this time? Spain was uh, the Germany, weren't they? Uh, Spain. Uh, and Portugal were uh, independent oh. and apparently neutral, but extremely sympathetic and gotcha. uh, and in touch with the Germans and all that. And so they're very sort of pro-German yeah. policy. Anyway, my parents, um, and it sounds very interesting, they took a, uh, a freighter uh, ship to America. Uh, this was a ship which... Uh, it was a freighter which could have taken 50 people, but there were 350 people, uh, old Jews, uh, all fleeing uh, Europe for America. My parents slept slept on the deck. Um, was it six weeks or three weeks probably across the... Uh, no, it took them... Uh, it was actually pretty fast for those days. And I think it took them... I can't remember anymore, okay. seven or eight weeks. Oh, and okay. they arrived in America. They were interred in Ellis Island, Ellis which Island. What the Americans did to uh, refugees. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, my, uh, my, we had uncles in America who swore affidavits. My parents finally were released, and, they, and there they were in America. And then they got in touch with the relatives in England to, to, to find out about uh, okay, their two sons. And, uh, okay, so we, we wanted to join our parents, but you couldn't in 1940 you know, travel across the Atlantic. It took us another year and a half <laughs> before we could get passage to join my parents, which we did eventually. We joined them in America in 1942. You know, when I think of that, I'm just thinking that like a 12, a 13 year old, you still, I mean, psychologically, that must have been, I mean, try Okay, now let me tell you uh, psychologically. Mm. This is just this is silly uh, biography, but. Uh, I was 13. Now, you know, a, a Jewish boy has a bar mitzvah at the age of 13. That's a, uh, that is um, um, what for Christians is, um, yeah. Yeah. what is it called? Yeah. Well, you you, you, you become an adult. Uh, yeah. what, 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 I can't think of the word. Well, the Christian thing, you become an adult, that's because you can commit sin, okay? <laughs> yes, but um, there's a ceremony Your first uh, communion? Uh, of adulthood. Well, for Jews, it's very important. Yeah, Bar Mitzvah sex. makes a Jewish boy a fully grown man and capable of participating in a yes. in a service. Yeah. Uh, so it's an extremely important. And they had they had made a big fuss for my brother when he he was Bar Mitzvah, and there I was, 13, uh, 1940, and you know what my reaction was? It tells you a lot about children. Typical of my parents. I mean, they you know they didn't want to. 
you know, give me the one mistress, they ran off to France, <laughs> they ran off to France, you know, running on all this bullshit about Hitler and all that, you know. I, I was totally anti, everybody talking about wars and then Hitler and this, I was really fed up with it. I, if anybody mentioned war, I left the room. I didn't want to know. Wow. I was in, uh, and, um, and my feel, I was glad to get rid of my parents. Uh, that's it. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and so I had this really, this sort of, uh, typical, it's very, it tells something very interesting about children. I mean, I didn't know, you know, I wasn't interested in Hitler, this and that. You know, my parents had dumped my brother and I in England, and they did it to screw me so that I wouldn't have the bar mitzvah. <laughs> you know, don't think that you can tell a 13 or 40 year old kid about the reality. Yeah. You know, come on. I My brother, who was 15, used, said to me, come on, what's the matter with you? Don't you realize? I said, no, I don't realize. You know, uh, they don't like me. They never like uh, me. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> the, the whole thing, the whole of World War II was a plot to get rid of me. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, this is just, That's tremendous, actually. I, just, it is I psychology. always remember that when I deal with kids, mm. uh, you mm. know, who've been dumped by their parents, I am, I know, don't try to tell them that it's, it's politics, the world, and all that. It's not their parents' fault, and all that. No, kids don't want to know that. And you know, parents are the only thing that interests you. And if you dump your 13 or 14 year old kid, he's going to blame you for it. It's just exactly like when you get divorced. Your children always, it's a very well-known thing, always blame themselves. Mm. They, my parents got divorced because of me. They never, if you say to a 14 or 15 year old, look, your parents didn't get along, you know, uh, whatever, yeah. Doesn't, no, doesn't it was me, you yeah. know. It's, at that age, everything is me, 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 me. You haven't got really all this concern with the rest of the world. It doesn't nothing to do with the history of economic thought. It's just uh, it's, it didn't read, it, it doesn't register yet. This, the, like your brother explained to you or yeah. stuff like that. Yeah. Okay, but that, yeah, but that, that maybe that explains. Like you, did you turn to books then or something, or is, did, did you? You said you were very intellectual from an early yes. age. Yeah. yeah. Uh, at the age of uh, fourteen, I read uh, uh, *Crime and Punishment* of Dostoevsky. Ooh. That was the kind of stuff that I really liked. Mm. <laughs> Excellent. Anyway, uh, I got, I don't know. So that's how you got to America. Yes. Eventually you got there. At the and I met people in, I, I met, I met friends, some people in America who, as I say, who introduced me to Stalin, Lenin, and all that, and that got me onto Marx. Ooh, now that would have been, that's pre-McCarthy era, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, yes. that's right. So that's... Uh, when, of course, uh, Soviet Union was uh, our ally. That's right. They, that's and, right. You know, everything was hunky dory. You know. So in those days, it was it was okay to be. Uh, that's right. Uh, it, was, it was before McCarthy. Because the you know the Russians. Uh, we get to McCarthy later. Did you know that I appeared before the McCarthy committee? No. Okay. No. I, well, let's talk about that. That's interesting. So you. I mean, I'm quite serious. I was interested in that connection. I thought, how in a, how could it be? Because you know, America's so anti-communist kind of stuff. But actually, in that period. Of, uh, just during the war in the 40s, the, the Russians were kind of the good guys helping Absolutely. stamp out the, the, yeah. the Nazis. And then, Stalin, and, right. and, and, and social, what's it, utopian socialism was a big thing in Britain too, wasn't it? The, the, the utopian socialists? So they, they kind of, maybe not so much well, communism. The communism was yes. more, it was a more re intellectually respectable then, wasn't yes. it? Yes, yes. Uh, socialists were certainly you know, popular. And it was certainly perfectly respectable. Uh, and even in high school. Yeah. You went, so you had a couple of years in high school before? Yeah, I had a couple of years in high school in, uh, in America. Two years of high school before I went to university. Uh, and by the time I was 17 or 18, I was really, really red hot on Marxism. Okay. I read every book, I mean, I was, I was re trying to read Das Kapital when I was hardly 18 and thought I understood it. Oh well, but you know. But As we were wont to do, you know. <laughs> uh, well, okay, uh, so that got you into college with this Marxist bent. So by the time I, by the time I went to Columbia and uh, had to, uh, I'd, I'd, I'd done a master's course in economics. Columbia was big then, weren't they? It, I don't know, it was, no, it wasn't big like Harvard, Yale, yeah. Princeton, Stanford, Princeton, Princeton, but it was a good, 
uh, university with well, a. Stigler was there. It had a, uh, a very strong institutionalist tradition, and uh, I took courses with John Morris Clark, uh, and a number of other quite well-known institutionalists, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I had already decided I wanted to do a, a PhD thesis in the history of economic thought. And the only person who, there were two people at Columbia with whom I could have done that. One of them called Joseph Dorfman. I know Dorfman, yeah. The historian of uh, Veblen, uh, uh, author of a well-known biography of Veblen. Oh, okay. So and you're reading Veblen as well. And Joseph Dorfman, to this day, in my opinion, is the most boring lecturer I had ever gone to. I fell asleep. I, I took his course in the history of economic thought, and I fell asleep literally, I think, on the second day. And I said to myself, I always remember thinking, I cannot take a course with a guy who's that boring. Who, by the way, used to uh, came to class with lecture notes, and just, just. I mean, I've always hated it. He read his lecture notes. I just, this was just unbelievable. I mean, and so then. The only other person was George Stigler, who I knew almost from the beginning. We were politically apart by 360 degrees. Okay, so you know, totally, you know. I mean, he became more and more right wing as he got older, but he was already pretty right wing, and I was, you know, red hot and all that. Um, but what's what's the age difference between you and Stigler at that time? Like we're talking late 40s now? Yeah, he was about 45. And you would have been a young yeah. gun. Yeah. And uh, how does a young gun get to know a, a guy like him? Because Stigler was still, he was, he was pretty, well, I'm trying to remember. He wasn't as famous yeah. then yeah. as he yeah. later became. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. He hadn't done the economic theory regulation, and uh, theory uh, his field, uh, his big uh, subject was industrial organization, yeah. which interested me a little bit, but not all that much. And I said to him, uh, I always remember our, sort of our first session was, uh, uh, well, I think I'd like to do something on the, the school of Ricardo. And, he, and his, his eyes sort of you know, lit up and he said, oh yeah, hey, that would uh, be very interesting. So, okay. And we immediately uh, got along very well. He was extremely... He only had two or three students ever, graduate students ever in his entire career, because he just he just butchered students. Really? I mean, he literally sort of literally the first session. Okay, what are your ideas? And he'd immediately destroy you there and then. <laughs> and I was also extremely combative, so he tried that with me, and I flared up. Yeah, we we picked it up here, okay? Yeah. And he he liked that. Yes, I can imagine. And we got along extremely well. He gave me very, very good criticisms, excellent criticisms. I mean, I always remember the first draft of the first few chapters of my thesis, he just completely destroyed it. And, and I realized he's absolutely right. <laughs> I mean, you know, I don't mind being destroyed if uh, if you learn from it, yeah. but, uh, that's interesting. I still think that that kind of motivation must go back to that. The a lot of us aren't so resilient, you know. And I'm thinking like this: the war stuff that happened to you probably made you a pretty tough little nut. Yeah, I was re very rebellious. Yeah, yeah, uh, and a real little prick. <laughs> you know, uh, very quick to to flare up, and you know, very sort of defensive. And, uh, and um, and it, but I loved I loved ideas. I loved in intellectual issues. You know, I loved arguing about this and that. So that's why you and Stigler got along. He probably yeah. really that really caught onto him too. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. So were you, this is an undergraduate or graduate? This is graduate. Graduate. So you kind of go. How do you go from undergraduate to graduate in those days? Like you do a master's. You do a master's degree and you write a master's essay. My master's essay was written uh, under the supervision of John Morris Clark on the difference between Chamberlain and Robinson in perfect competition versus monopolistic competition, which in those days 
uh, the debate between Chamberlain and Robinson are really dated to us now, uh, 1940s, you know, debate. Uh, but I, I, I love the idea of these uh, these two battling it out, which is it? Perfect competition, not place competition. Yeah, and, and I wrote an essay which, uh, thank God, at some point I threw into the waste paper basket and would probably really be embarrassing to read. But uh, I really got into economics that way. That's right, yeah. Were you starting to read the old guys then, like Ricardo and well, Smith and John Stuart Mill? No, probably not. Not really, not really reading Ricardo himself, although I soon did. But I certainly commentary on Ricardo. Yeah, so the big uh, guys that when you were doing it, you got, Hicks was big then? Oh, yeah, very big. Like Hicks was big. Oh, yes. Who are the other big? Well, I mean, Keynes. Oh, that's right. I mean, she's just you know. I I so my ignorance. Uh, and I was never very interested in Keynes, which uh, was not yet a big subject. Uh, there was not all that tremendous interest in Keynes, but there was already, of course, a okay. literature on the Keynesian revolution. But I I was never really attracted to macroeconomics. Uh, yeah. <laughs> then, and I'm not really attracted to it even now, right. although of course I've you know, read a lot of macro and all that, right. but I've always preferred micro. Um, but you got into this history of economic thought and methodology stuff in a way which, not, I mean, you, you must have been one of the kind of people who helped develop that field, wouldn't you? I was uh, too far ahead of my time. <laughs> what do you mean by that? Well. People weren't really interested in methodology, mm. um, and and I always remember when I uh, when I finished my doctoral dissertation uh, on uh, Ricard in economics, which eventually was my first book. Uh, at Columbia, in those days, when you uh, defended your doctoral thesis, you did it in front of the whole department, all the entire department of economics came to every defense of a doctoral dissertation because there weren't that many. Yeah. And so uh, I always remember there was 35 people in the room yeah, and I was presenting and there weren't more than uh, probably three or four people who were interested in you know, the topic, that kind of topic that I was doing. Uh, and it was Joseph Dorfman who was who by then realized that I'd never gone to any of his lectures. <laughs> and, uh, and he was uh, usually a very mild man, but he, asked, he really asked me some nasty questions. Uh, and uh, uh, I sort of answered him, but I very quickly flared up. And I always remember George Stigler, at one point I sort of said something very sharp to Joseph Dorfman in reply to some question. And, and Stigler grabbed me, sort of, I was sitting next to him, you know, on the table, and said to me later, you know, uh, if Joseph Dorfman vetoes, you know, the thesis, I mean, every member of the department has the right to veto any dissertation. That's interesting. So do not, you know, Pissing annoy him. him. Okay, uh, that's the end. So, uh, so what was your left-wing thing then? You said uh, at that stage you're still kind of Marxist left-wing. That would have um, and it cost you in the McCarthy era when that happened. Well, uh, my first teaching job was at Queens College, uh, which was a city, New York City College, one of the three. It was Brooklyn City College, uh, New York, and Queens College. And mm -hmm. I, my first teaching uh, assignment. Uh, I mean, I was a, what was called a tutor, sort of balloon assistant professor uh, at Queen's College. Uh, and uh, this is 1953. The McCarthy Committee, which was in a senatorial committee, came to New York to investigate communism in the New York college system. They, they called up uh, certain prominent uh, faculty members so you were who were known to be left-wing. And one of the people they called up was a woman called Vera Schlockman who told, taught labor economics at Queens College. 
uh, and who was very left wing. Uh, and she appeared before the committee and they asked her questions and she did the usual thing, First and Fifth Amendment I refused to. And uh, she was immediately fired by the president of the university, whose forgettable name was Thatcher. <laughs> I'm sorry, I've never forgotten the name Thatcher. Uh, wow. And the, she was an extremely popular teacher very, very good teacher. And I had taken her course in labor economics. Mm. The students uh, tried to raise a petition to the president of the university to, the, to ask for her to be reinstated. For a student petition to be submitted to the president, it had to be signed by one member of the department. And the students went to every member of the economics department, which was about 30, and they all refused to, to endorse the petition. Because this was the McCarthy period where he, if you so much as defended somebody accused of being a communist, you were practically a communist. They went around to every member of the department and they finally came to the juniors, including me as a tutor. And I, I thought, you know, I cannot not sign this petition Fantastic. because she was an excellent teacher she never said anything in her lectures that you could call communist and so on never I mean, you know, she was sort of left wing in her interest in labor but it was there was no political motivation in her teaching and all that um, so I signed the petition I always remember I signed it at 11 o'clock in the morning and at two o'clock, there was in my pigeonhole a notice from the president of the university, Thatcher. Uh, you have no no, no tenure here. Uh, I advise you to uh, resign. Uh, uh, and if you don't resign within 24 hours, so I, I remember going home and ringing up some people and saying, "What the hell do I do now?" And they all said, "Resign." Because if you don't resign, they'll put you on a blackmail. They'll put you on a blacklist. And you'll never get another teaching job. So, I resigned. Uh, wow. Whereupon, the McCarthy Committee the next day, uh, I got a letter from the McCarthy Committee, to appear before the committee. Together with, I don't know, some other people. Uh, and I always remember... Um, that evening, I, I uh, wrote a, a statement before the committee that I thought surely would rank in the annals of uh, great speech making with the, the Gettysburg Address. You know, I and mean, it would always be remembered as one of the great statement of protest. You know, I told the committee to uh, go fuck yourself. <laughs> I appeared before the committee with this. Yeah, do you have anything to say? Yes, I do. You know. Uh, no, we don't want to hear that. And I never got, never got to read it. It, it was one of those, uh, I was, whenever I have to give a lecture, I always think, hey, this is going to be like the McCarthy Committee at the last minute. They're going to tell me that we don't want to hear that. Oh, wow. What an experience. So, wait a minute. It, it, it has a punchline. So there it was. Uh, the committee wouldn't hear, uh, you know, uh, I had resigned. Uh, I was pretty sure I was going to be blacklisted and I went home very depressed and that evening the telephone rang hello your name is Mark Blount yes uh, you have been uh, this is the Social Science Research Council you have been awarded a fellowship to go to England to write your PhD thesis but wait a minute I haven't even applied for it yes you have Ooh. this was these were people during the McCarthy Committee, quietly assisting victims. This went, this happened to other people. Amazing. All behind, you know, this, this is the good bit. They were good people. Uh, and the Social Science Research Council was a very prestigious council that financed fellowships and uh, doctoral programs for students. So I found myself a week or two later on a boat 
to England and there began the most wonderful year and a half of my life because as I I went to London uh, I rented a, uh, a room behind the British Museum and I went every day to the British Museum uh, I always used to love the fact that uh, uh, people said uh, that was the desk that uh, Lenin used to use uh, and, uh, and I went every day to the British Museum and started really working on the thesis and I just loved it within a week or two or three I thought to myself this is how I'm going to spend the rest of my life this is really great read, 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 read you know uh, I collected you know, notes and notes and notes and um, which eventually became uh, the doctoral dissertation which one of the best things that George Sigler ever did for me when I was when it was all finished and all approved he said forget about it for six months don't look at it read something else and then rewrite it and he was so <laughs> right because when I think you know of the difference between the rewrite and what it had been originally like night and day uh, I vastly improved it and it ended up being a book which I'm not you know madly proud of but I'm not terribly ashamed of either uh, pretty good for a young guy yes yeah, so that was your that was really a passion for you wasn't it yes yeah. it was a passion yeah I can imagine you going down you know just going down the library and for you say I am basically the same way every time I open a book any book I get a feeling of, hey, maybe this is going to be one of the great intellectual experiences. You know, uh, okay, as you well know, you have to read 50 books to find one that really sends you. But when it sends you, I really love it. There's nothing like it. So when you're in London, and this, uh, tell me the time period, you're talking 54, 53? 53, 54. Okay, and... Um, I got my PhD in 55. Okay, so you're... you're you're a single guy in London, going down to the library, pouring yourself into books. What other vices did you have at that time? What? What other vices did you have at that time? I what kept already, you sane? Did you I drink? I met my, Coffee? Uh, I had already been uh, married once. Uh, and divorced. But I met my second wife in that period. And I, one of the things that I always remember is, I was so intensely working on this doctoral dissertation that for the first time in my life I didn't really miss sex all that much. I mean, I, didn't, I, I, I had this <laughs> girlfriend and I used to, you know, she, uh, she wasn't in London, she was outside London, I used to see her occasionally, but I, it was very much like being a monk. I mean, I've always thought, hey, I would have, it really suited me to have been a medieval monk. Okay. I'd like to have a nunnery across the street that I occasionally visit, but when I'm really reading and studying, I don't need sex. Wow. Or at least much less. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. It's the one thing that really stops me thinking about sex. <laughs> <laughs> that is good. So I just still, every now and then, I still occasionally read a book that really gets me going intellectually, you know, and, and for days I can't think of anything else and uh, I want to, you know, uh, I tell Ruth, I bore Ruth to death by telling her all about it and all that. Exactly. You know. yeah, yeah. Uh, so what do you do when, when people don't, I mean, you're like, not people, you say you're close, intimate friends, uh, don't get the passion? Well, uh, I, 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 well realized that it's not everybody's cup of tea. Yeah. Okay. Was this a lady, uh, an intellectual, um, uh, that you met, the, your second wife, and, or that you, the, your girlfriend in London? But she yeah. was an academic as well? Or? Uh, she was not an academic. She was a psychiatric social worker. And she didn't have all the intellectual passions. Uh, so she was not, uh, for me, as good a wife as Ruth is. Uh, yeah, because Ruth is, uh, seems to be yeah. passionate about her, her work as well. Yeah, and so she, you know, she doesn't. Uh, she, we don't have exactly the same interests, but uh, but we have a 
a very common interest in economics and we talk a lot. Um, I talk about, she tells me about her work and I tell her about my work and I, I think it's lovely. Uh, yes, but so there's a long time between uh, 54 and the time you met Ruth, isn't there? Yes, yes. Uh, oh, you know. <laughs> We're ticking away here in the clock, okay? <laughs> So, yeah, that's, that's but those are two huge experiences. I mean, the war uh, and the absence of your parents and that, and then the, the McCarthy era yes. sort of thing. I mean, like, I, I mean, I, just listening to you, I'm, I, I feel very proud for you to, to have stood up. And, and I mean, I don't know whether I've got the gumption to do that either. But I'm, I'm, it, it, it's amazing that you did. And then three hours later, you get a bloody letter saying you're I was, fired. I was young, and uh, I had much more... I was oh, I wasn't so concerned about career and all that. I mean, I didn't have. When you get older, you say, "Hey, wait a minute! I can't. You know, I'm going to really think about my career and get a job and all that." But I had very much. I, I was young. I had to sort of, you know, screw them. You know, uh, I I was not concerned about career, uh, and I'd, I'd already had a. Uh, I worked my way through university. I worked as a waiter. I worked as a chef in a restaurant, oh, uh, as an assistant, and to this day I've always, one of the things that I really like to think is, uh, if I lose my job, I'll go back to dishwashing, you know, you, I did it before, I it doesn't do it bother again. me, you know, uh, you know, academic life is great and all that, but if I, you know, if for some reason I couldn't be an academic, and I was forced out and thrown out on the street, hey, listen, I can make a living. Uh, nice, very nice. In the, um, did you have an intellectual community in London when you were doing the museum thing, or was it kind of on your own at that time? Very little. Uh, I uh, didn't really have... Uh, it took some time to sort of develop uh, intellectual friends in London. Uh, I had had them in New York. Mm. I had a very good friend. Uh, I think this had a lot to do when I, when I was uh, get, getting into Marx and all that. I had a very good close friend who is now dead. Uh, who was himself also a red hot <laughs> communist, uh, uh, and indeed he and I gradually, I, I became much more disillusioned with all this. And by the time that Stalin died in 1953, I was well away from it, all this, and he wasn't. And so we got into the interesting thing where you know, he stayed true, whereas I <laughs> betrayed the cause. Uh, became increasingly skeptical and cynical about the whole thing. So who took, <laughs> off, who took over after Stalin in Russia? Was there, like I'm just trying to remember, was uh, Khrushchev's speech in 1956, the funeral speech, uh, delivered in secret to a communist party, to a meeting of communist party leaders in Europe, in which he told them the truth about Stalin. I mean, he told them uh, about the Gulag Archipelago, uh, a lot of other things. And that uh, meeting was leaked. At the time, everybody said, oh yeah, CIA is making it up and all that. Uh, who Can we really believe this leak and all that? Uh, the moment I heard it, I mean, it was I thought, this really justified what I have been thinking since 1953. I was right. Stalin was a son of a bitch. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and I can well remember uh, friends of mine who were real lifetime Communist Party members who cried when they heard about Khrushchev's speech or read about Khrushchev's speech. They cried because and I remember some of them heart, heartbreaking to me. They said, my whole life has been spent in lies. You spend a whole life you know, dedicated to a cause which we now realize you know, is a total betrayal. <coughs> and I can remember as a graduate student at Columbia, There was a small group of us who were all very, very left-wing. And I can remember the Review of Economics and Statistics published an article by Naum Yazi. 
a Soviet, a Russian Soviet expert, which used a a, a document uh, which the Nazis confiscated uh, of the of Russian prison authorities which gave data on the number of prisoners in the Gulag archipelago and the, pic and the, and the number that Nam Yazni used in this article was one million prisoners and I can remember all, all of us sitting, all these electric guys sitting around the table and saying is it possible that they had a, a million political prisoners and uh, I thought yes, and a lot of the other guys said no, no, it's just poppycock. I mean, it's just American propaganda. It's, you know, who, how can that possibly be? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it, it's still every time I read about you know anything about the Gulag Archipelago, and I realize, you know, it was true. We could believe it mm -hmm. because what has never happened before, you can't believe. It's just like uh, Jews who couldn't leave uh, Germany in 1933-34 because they thought Hitler was just a gangster and any uh, and any time now uh, he'll, be yeah, he'll be overthrown. <coughs> and that, I mean, you know, and the I didn't believe the news about concentration camps and the Holocaust when I first started to hear about it in 1942-43. I thought it was just, hey, I remember World War I propaganda, you know, about the Germans and all that. I, I cannot be. They could not have, uh, you know, put millions of Jews in, in a concentration camp. I just couldn't believe it. I very reluctantly accepted it. I've always been very skeptical, you know, and, uh, about political news and all that. I'm very, very dubious about this. And I was the same way then. Uh, so they said, so the... the um, the internment both of the Jews and then of the political prisoners in Russia like that, that kind of, there's a skepticism, but you felt with the Russian one that you felt that this, there was something there. And I came to believe it after a while and uh, I, I guess at the time I would have said, well, man, not a million, but you know, half a million. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I was reading um, um, Robert Fisk's uh, Great War Against Civilization. Yes, yes. On the, uh, which I, 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 Only 1,400 pages. Yeah, I got through, I'm through about page 1100. I got a bit But reading, tired. A, reading a, on Armenia, I, I, I knew yes. nothing about Armenia. Armenia, yes. I, and I, I was just thinking, the Armenian how, Holocaust. How could this happen, you know? Uh, yeah. And, and I, there were, yeah, it was just... Um, yes. To this day, I've not read any account, including Fisk, that it really explains why the Turks were so uh, punitive towards Armenians uh, and when they went to these sort of rampage, killing rampage, uh, it's amazing, very hard to believe. I mean a lot of, there are things in uh, human history of which is only one example where you simply cannot believe that people could have just gone on and on and on. I agree. Uh, but you were obviously pretty sensitive to that stuff in the, in the 50s. I was just going up. Okay, I was, what was I, 10 years old? Um, and so uh, I was where you were in, uh, in 40. Uh, these, are, these, you know, these were things that... JFK's assassination is what I, the first political event that I remember that, that struck me as I was uh, uh, in high school. What was it, 60, 62, 64? Like you, like so many other people, including me, remembers the day of Kennedy's assassination. Well, that, I mean, that was my first participation in political things. I mean, you had it from the war from the beginning. Yeah. I mean, my God, you know, that's... A, uh, even though you knew that the war was dedicated to hurting you, so you couldn't have your bar mitzvah. <laughs> I s sometimes when I um, watch some program on television about uh, World War II, uh, like for example, uh, uh, that Hitler could have, that he came close to having the bomb. I mean, that Heis if Heisenberg had. Uh, if Heisenberg had not told the Nazis, hey, forget about it, it's, it's uh, technically impossible, they might have, they got pretty close. And I really get the sort of cold shivers because when I think 
Jesus Christ, if they had had the atomic bomb, they would have used, they it. Would have used it. They wouldn't have had, they wouldn't have done what Harry Truman w said, which is, it's okay to drop it on Japs, but don't drop it on Europeans. You know, uh, which is exactly what well, what happened. Exactly. Hitler yeah. would have dropped it on London. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, they got so close to winning World War II. Yeah, I became uh, a little bit obsessed recently with trying to understand the logic behind the decisions to drop the bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Oh, I've got, oh boy, have I got into that. Is that right? Yes, I can understand uh, the logic. Um, the Japanese were a terrible foe because they, they would have fought to the last <laughs> Japanese soldier. They would have gone on and on and on. They would have taken 100,000 American dead to have invaded Japan. And I can well believe two things. One is we don't want to kill 100,000 American soldiers beating the Japanese, and in, in addition, they're only, they're only Japanese. They're only Asians. Is that right? Well, I think, why didn't they drop it on Berlin? They didn't drop it on Berlin because they... This is entirely conjectural. That there would have been an outrage in America, France, Britain, uh, at the idea that the Americans would use an atomic bomb on on Europeans, but there was a Japan was so far away, uh, and there was an awful sort of lot of um, quiet racism. I mean, that wasn't the first time. I mean, uh, America, you know, interred uh, the Japanese in California during World War Two, and it, it, went, it went very smoothly. There was yes, no protest about yes, it. I, there was I, no protest about it. Yeah, they, and, and it, they just didn't enter it. They confiscated the property. And, yes. Uh, Outrageously. Yes. Outrageously. Yeah. Because the Canadians participated in that a little bit too. And only a few years ago, America was so anti-Japanese because of the Japanese economic successes that you, you, it was very common to go to the United States and hear really racist talk about the Japanese, which has all disappeared because the Japanese, thank God, had a depression and they haven't done so well economically. But this will happen about China. Interesting. But you're obviously interested in like the political stuff and what happened with Khrushchev's speech, you said, and I mean, here you're a young ac academic um, and you're in London. Uh, this was in London that you uh, were you connected. No, by the time about Dan Khrushchev's speech, I was already at, at Yale. I was an assistant professor at Yale. Wow! So you went from London uh, to yeah. Uh, I went uh, when I finished my PhD. Uh, Where was Schumpeter at this time? What was Schumpeter at Harvard? Schumpeter? Yeah. Uh, Schumpeter was at Harvard. Yeah. Always was. Yeah, uh, that's what I thought. I was just wondering. So you didn't run in with you? You no. didn't have any runs with him? No, I wish I had, but yeah. no. Uh, would have been nice. Yeah. Uh, but uh, my, after after all that uh, stuff with the uh, McCarthy Committee at Queen's College and all that, I, I, I published my, uh, I didn't publish, I finished my doctoral dissertation and I started looking again for, for work. And I was very worried about whether I would ever get, get work after that thing at Queen's College. And uh, 1954, Yale, announced, uh, Yale uh, offered a, uh, a one-year teaching post uh, in economics. And I thought, well, better than nothing. I applied and was interviewed by a small committee which included William Fellner, does the name mean anything? Oh yes, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Okay, now, in the course of the interview, I hit it lucky, I didn't realize. William Fellner had been teaching the history of economic thought at Yale, and he wanted out, he wanted to do something else. 
and he was looking for a young teacher who would take over his course in history of Islamic thought. And he said to me, well, would you, if we hired you for you, would you teach a history of Islamic thought? At the graduate level. Oh, okay. <laughs> the graduate students. I said, sure. Great. Yeah. Then I said, but I think I should tell you that I had to resign from Queen's College because I was called before the McCarthy Committee. And, and I always remember, Felder sort of virtually got out of his chair and he said, we don't want to know about that. This is a private university, Yale. We don't want to know what happened at a government. Felder had already had a McCarthy experience at California. When Truman passed the loyalty oath, which was the beginning of McCarthyism, I'll never forgive him. Truman for it. The loyalty oath. Every civil servant and every academic had to sign a loyalty oath to the United States and Fellner refused. And so he left Berkeley, uh, which was a state university, and came to Yale, which is a private university. <coughs> and so he he absolutely would not allow you know any remarks of my experience and all that. And so I got the job doubly. One, because I was going to teach his course in the history of economic thought. And secondly, uh, now, worked in your advantage. There I was, 1954, I was 27 years old. Uh, and I stood up in front of a class of master students at Yale, all of whom were admitted as all the top American universities on the basis of a very generous scholarship. And I always remember that in that class, there was one student who gave me a hell of a lot of trouble. I had finished a course in mathematical economics with Gerard de Beau, and I was very proud of, of my ability to write some equations on the board. And every time I wrote an equation on the board, there was this one student who would say, well, I think you know, it's not X. It's not the square root of x, you know, it's, it's x over y, and then he corrected it. And he was usually right. And I really got to hate the student. <laughs> and what was the, who was the student? Edmund Phelps. Already then as now, a very arrogant guy who loved, you know, correcting students, uh, teachers, uh, and very quick to sort of, wait a minute, uh, let's sort that out, I think you're wrong, you know. Uh, I always, <laughs> I always remember that because years, years later, I ran into him at a conference. And I went up to him and I said, uh, Ed, do you remember me? Of course he said, yeah, sure, of course. And I said, you know, you have no idea that I've been, I taught that first year and you were always correcting me and all that. You have no idea how close you came to being strangled. And, you know, <laughs> and he laughed. I mean, he, he, he sort of enjoyed, he enjoyed that story. Yeah. Uh, and when he got the Nobel Prize, I groaned. He was arrogant then, now he'll be really impossible. <laughs> Very smart, clever guy uh, who, I mean, he got the Nobel Prize for uh, the alternative version to the, uh, the natural rate of. Uh, unemployment uh, much better expounded than Milton Friedman did, but not as well, not as beautifully, uh, rhetorically, not as well set out. Interesting. But yeah. technically much, much better, uh, but not worth the, in my opinion, not worth the Nobel Prize. Uh, have you functioned on the Nobel Prize Committee, or have people asked you for your input into Sorry? Have you have you been asked to kind of review uh, candidates for Nobel Prizes? And I have indeed. Oh, excellent. Okay. Three times. And uh, my proposals were, <laughs> were always turned out. <laughs> what is there? Some sort of, was it a 50-year moratorium or something on releasing the, the transcripts about the, the evaluate these people? I, I heard about that. There's, 
and there's something so that you're quite right to create some sort of commitment for people to say well yes. you can say what you like to say and no one will know for 50 years or I think there is something like that mm -hmm. I, I uh, didn't remember it was 50 years but it's certainly a long period yeah. uh, okay that's interesting so you went from uh, so the Yale was your first basic teaching experience yes. and, and, well, that's, and, and that's, that's where really you got, how you got into the history of economic yeah, thought teaching. I worked so hard on teaching that course mm -hmm. talk about over preparation uh, and I think for every lecture, you know, one hour lecture, I must have prepared five hours. And by the end of it, I had a file of notes and wrote economic theory and retrospect entirely from those notes. Uh, I mean, I had really worked hard. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, uh, that's it. So the origin of that book came from that course, and uh, came from that and, and the over preparation for the course. Yes, the over preparation is right. Uh, well, it's investment, okay. And, and, and it's funny. Uh, some of the uh, I had a a really fantastic class. I mean, it wasn't only uh, Ed Feltz, but a couple of other uh, Jeff Shepard, who is. Uh, Editor of the Journal of Industrial Organization, all that. And, uh, some very, uh, really good uh, students, and some of whom I've said, you know, how, 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 what was the course like from the point of view of being a student? You know, well, most of them very kind. They said, hey, it was a good course and all that. But the course was over prepared. Mm. Uh, years and years in the history of economic thought, and running into people who say, what's your specialty? History of economic thought. Really? Uh, gosh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Why don't you get into something interesting? I mean, I ran into all this sort of disdain of the history of economic thought by most economists, and I got to the point where I really got fed up with it. And I said, okay, enough already. I'm now going to do something really practical. I'm going to do some applied economics. And I got, in various ways, I got into the economics of education, and I spent... 10, 15 years of my life, uh, human capital theory, economics of education, and, all that. and in that connection, advised uh, UN agencies. Uh, I went all over Africa, I went all over Asia. Uh, I wrote a book uh, on India, uh, the uh, graduate unemployment in India, uh, and I loved, uh, I loved India. And still, I still visit India, one of my favorite countries. Uh, so I, I spent a good 15, 18 years out of the history of economic thought, but I came back to it in the end as my first love. Uh, and it's still what I really, even now, like best. Uh, and certainly, I love teaching it and still find it absolutely fascinating. Yeah, interesting. I, I love the history of ideas. Uh, you know, when I study uh, anything, I mean, Math, I mean, we really got into the history of mathematics. God, that's when I really began, hey, this stuff is really fascinating. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the calculus, w when you really understand the, the conflict between Leibniz and Newton about the concept of the infinitesimal increment, you, hey, this is much more interesting, the philosophy of that is much more interesting to me than all the calculations of the first derivative, or, you know, which is just, the engineering, really. Yeah. Yeah. So I've never been interested in mathematics as a technique, but I'm, the philosophy of mathematics really fascinates me. Yeah. Did, so did you, as a, as a sort of student, did you take courses in philosophy, or or is it just something you, you a skill you picked up? No, I never learning? really. No, I never really took courses in philosophy. But you it, read. It's really uh, private reading. Yeah. And to this day, uh, I often think. Uh, yeah, maybe I would have been happier, you know, studying philosophy rather than economics. Uh, and, and to this day, what interests me in economics is the philosophical, methodological issues. Is it a science? Is it, you know, what kind of science is it? You know, funny kind of science. How do you ever? I mean, I still think the great, uh, the really great questions are: How do you ever decide? on the basis of evidence to believe anything. I, I'm really interested in parapsychology, 
people with weird ideas who, uh, you know, who think uh, you can talk to, you can make plants grow by, uh, to, you know, standing in front of them and loving them and all that. Oh yeah, that's very interesting. What's the evidence for that? How do you decide to believe in something? I'm, I'm interested in why people believe the weird things they believe. It's one of my favorite books, one of the favorite titles of the book. <laughs> the weird things that people believe and why they believe in it I'm by some guy, I don't know. But that's what really interests me. Mm -hmm. And I, I like nothing better than meeting people who say, hey, I, I, you know, I've been abducted by aliens. Uh, and I really believe that we're visited by aliens. Oh, really? Tell me about the evidence. You know, that's what really, that, that really interests me. Well, that's the uh, end of our interview with Mark. Thanks for being with us. Cheers, John. Mm -hmm.